There are two parts to the human dilemma. One is the belief that the end justifies the means. That push-button philosophy, that deliberate deafness to suffering has become the monster in the war machine. The other is the betrayal of the human spirit. The assertion of dogma that closes the mind and turns a nation, a civilization, into a regiment of ghosts. It's said that science will dehumanize people and turn them into numbers. That's false, tragically false. Look for yourself. This is the concentration camp and crematorium at Auschwitz. This is where people were turned into numbers. Into this pond were flushed the ashes of some four million people. And that was not done by gas. It was done by arrogance. It was done by dogma. It was done by ignorance. When people believe that they have absolute knowledge with no test in reality, this is how they behave. This is what men do when they aspire to the knowledge of gods. I owe it as a human being to the many members of my family who died here to stand here as a survivor and a witness. We have to cure ourselves of the itch for absolute knowledge and power. We have to close the distance between the push-button order and the human act. We have to touch people. Bronowski clip makes it absolutely clear that tonight is not the Dimbleby lecture. And when you've heard Dr. Humphrey, I think you will understand why I'm entering this caveat. We do have two major annual television lectures, Dimbleby and Bronowski, and I'm sure you'd agree that it wouldn't have been very sensible for both of them to have covered the same general thesis. Now, this thesis is likely to prove highly controversial, but there's nothing wrong with that. We may all be able to agree with the central analysis, but disagree with the conclusions to be drawn from them. And some people might think it's particularly appropriate that it is a Russian proverb which says, make yourself into a sheep and you'll meet a wolf nearby. But that's not the point. What does matter is that the BBC should continue to provide a forum for a wide variety of views, popular or unpopular, and irrespective of whether they represent majorities or minorities. Maybe the BBC isn't quite the Hyde Park speaker's corner of the air. Limited time and airwaves inevitably mean selection. But the editorial processes involved in that selection are finally and irrevocably rooted in free speech. And so I'm very glad that Dr. Humphrey will be talking tonight about the most serious subject of all for mankind. His treatment is novel in that he comes to this from his position as a distinguished a psychologist. He is assistant director of the Department of Animal Behavior at Cambridge. He's carried out fundamental research into the nature of visual perception, including a major part in the discovery of blind sight, that's to say, vision without conscious awareness, the evolution of intelligence, the biology of aesthetics, and the nature of human consciousness have all fallen under his perceptive and original eye. Last year, he won a traveling fellowship for his program called An Illusion of Beauty. Perhaps this might have formed the alternative title for his talk tonight, which is called Four Minutes to Midnight, Dr. Nicholas Humphrey. Jacob Bronowski went in, in November 1945 as a member of the British Mission 
to the Japanese city of Nagasaki. In August that year, President Truman, with the agreement of Winston Churchill, had ordered that the city and its population be destroyed by an atomic bomb. The bomb dropped on Nagasaki on August the 9th killed 70,000 people. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima three days earlier killed 140,000. In the central square mile of each city, nine out of every 10 people died. Nine out of 10 of those nine out of 10 weren't soldiers or politicians. They were children, mothers, gray-haired old men and women. At the outbreak of war in 1939, such an attack by the Allies on non-combatant civilians would have been unthinkable. Civilized nations still clung to a morality which enjoined them to respect life and to limit suffering, even of those in arms against them. A morality which taught a naval captain that he must, having sunk an enemy ship, he must rescue the survivors from the sea, and a prison camp commander that he must treat with chivalry his prisoners of war. It was a morality which forbade at all times the use of indiscriminate violence against an unarmed population. The Allies had gone to war against the barbarous state of Nazi Germany to protect these very values. But civilization and the world had come a long way between 1939 and 1945. Hitler was dead. He'd lost the battle. But the policies of terror, which Hitler himself had pioneered, had, it seemed, won the war. Brunowski recalls that as he stood amongst the ruins of Nagasaki, his imagination was dwarfed by the catastrophe. He was a man we know, not often lost for words, but here he had none adequate. It was, he says, a universal moment. Civilization face to face with its own consequences. The world had come a long way between 1939 and 1945. It's come far further between 1945 and 1981. There are today in readiness for military use, not two, but 50,000 nuclear weapons. Bronowski made a television series, The Ascent of Man. Must what goes up come down? Looking at our progress over the last 30 years, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that mankind, having flown too near the sun, is already in a stall. There are voices enough now raised in warning, the voices of statesmen who previously have been attended to. Lord Mountbatten, speaking in Strasbourg a few weeks before he was assassinated. The world now stands on the brink of the final abyss. Professor George Kennan, former United States ambassador to Russia, speaking in Washington this year. We've gone on piling weapon upon weapon, missile upon missile, like the victims of some sort of hypnotism, like men in a dream, like lemmings heading for the sea. On the front cover of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the doomsday clock set at 10 minutes to midnight some years ago was advanced by six minutes last January. Four minutes to go. I want to ask a simple question. Why? Why do we behave like lemmings? Why do we let it happen? In the words of Lord Mountbatten, how can we stand by and do nothing to prevent the destruction of our world? Mountbatten said in the same speech, do the frightening facts about the arms race, which show that we are rushing headlong towards the precipice, make any of those responsible for this disastrous course, pull themselves together and reach for the brakes? The answer is no. I want to ask how the answer can be no. I leave it to others to explain our extraordinary plight in terms of military necessity, economic competition, or the politics of the Cold War. My concerns are more primitive. I'm concerned as a psychologist with the feelings, perceptions, and motives of individual human beings. When a lemming runs, it isn't pushed or pulled by outside forces. It runs to destruction on its own four feet. It's as individuals that we might, could, can and might apply the brakes, and as individuals that we could and do fail. Responsibility for this disastrous course begins right here. Perhaps there's an obvious answer, which is that we're simply unaware. 
Is it possible that we either don't know or, or else discount the dangers of the arms race? That we think the bonfire which is being built, ab built around us will never catch light. Indeed, that the larger it comes, the, s the, safer, the safer it becomes. When I was a child, we had an old pet tortoise we called Ajax. One autumn, Ajax, looking for a winter home, crawled unnoticed into the pile of wood and bracken my father was making for Guy Fawkes Day. As days passed, and more and more pieces of tinder were added to the pile, Ajax must have felt more and more secure. Every day he was getting greater protection from the frost and rain. On November the 5th, bonfire and tortoise were reduced to ashes. Of the some of us who still believe that the piling up of weapon upon weapon adds to our security, that the dangers are nothing compared to the assurance they provide? Yes, there are some of us. And it's hardly surprising that there are, for those in authority do very little of anything to inform us of the dangers. We don't hear the British Prime Minister talking about the world being, being on the brink of the final abyss. We don't hear the Defence Secretary talking about the nuclear arms race as being clearly without logic. The Director General of the BBC protects television audiences from seeing the film The War Game because he calculates, quite rightly, that people would find it alarming and distressing. Newspaper editors, defence correspondents, have become apologists for official policy instead of serving their traditional and honoured role as critics. And when we do get news of what's going on, it's couched in a language designed to enlist our admiration for the marvels of military technology and to quiet our fears and blunt our sensitivities. News speak, Pentagon speak, is employed by military spokesmen to distance us from the reality. It's become commonplace, as the Archbishop of Canterbury observed in a speech in Washington, to refer to the destruction of a city and its population as demographic targeting. And yet, and yet, not everyone, not even the majority of the population is taken in. Opinion polls carried out in the past year show that despite all the talk about the effectiveness of a deterrent strategy, nearly half the adult population expects nuclear war within their lifetime. Despite all the talk about civil defense, less than one in 10 believes that they and their families would not be killed. Never in recent times, not since the plagues and famines of the Middle Ages, can so many people of this country have had such a pessimistic vision of the future. But does this pessimism stir them into action? When questioned on behalf of the magazine New Society, 70% of the public said that they were worried about nuclear weapons, but nine out of 10 of this 70% stated either that nothing could be done or else that they themselves were unwilling to do anything. And even for the one in 10 who said they might do something, the actions mentioned would seem to be totally incommensurate with the perceived dangers. They'd go on a march, they'd write a letter to the newspapers. It's as though we've become passive, fascinated spectators of the slowly unfolding nuclear tragedy. I was taught at school that the essential quality of a tragic play is this. When the curtain rises, you see a gun on the wall, and you know that in the last act, the hero or heroine will take that gun from the wall and shoot themselves. It has to be so. The internal logic of the play allows no other ending. But now, we are not the audience to this play, it's we who will get shot. It's easy for those of us who aren't historians to kid ourselves that nothing like this has ever happened before, and that because it has never happened before, it can't really be happening now. But it has happened before, if never on such a disastrous scale. There are, in fact, dreadful precedents in history, times when whole groups of human beings, men and women whose love of life was no less than our own, have gone almost without protest to destruction like the victims of hypnotism, like men in a dream, like lemmings heading for the sea. I think of the long-suffering European Jews in the last war, of the way so many of them patiently took the trains to the extermination camps, of what happened in 1942 in the ravine near Kiev, known as Babi Yar, where thousand upon thousand queued up for execution Mothers and fathers, hand in hand with children, shuffling their way slowly forwards till they reached the front of the line and were gunned down. 
I think of the victims of the Stalinist purges in the Russia of the 1930s, of the way, week by week, people saw their comrades disappear into the torture chambers and the jails. They knew they would be next and waited. In her brave memoir of the purges, Hope Against Hope, Nadezhda Mandelstam, widow of the poet Osip Mandelstam, describes how with disbelief she watched first her friends and finally her husband go the way of all the others. Later, she writes, later I often wondered whether it's right to scream when you're being be beaten and trampled underfoot. I decided it is better to scream. This pitiful sound is a concentrated expression of the last vestige of human dignity. By his screams, a man asserts his right to live, sends a message to the outside world demanding help and calling for resistance. If nothing else is left, one must scream. Silence is the real crime against humanity. Why don't we scream? Why, when faced with a nuclear threat, do so many of us adopt a policy of quietism and collaboration? Why do we choose appeasement rather than protest? Daddy, what are you doing to stop the next war? The man in the pictures, many different people, and the answer appropriate to one person won't necessarily be appropriate to another. But he's me, and he's you. And in trying to explain why it is that so many people are doing nothing, I won't take the easy path of suggesting explanations of a kind which always seem to fit other people so much better than ourselves. Explanations in terms, say, of moral shallowness, unthinking obedience to authority, or plain stupidity. No doubt the world does have its fair share of mindless sheep, and no doubt they are doing nothing, but they're not alone. And I want tonight to bring the discussion nearer home, to focus on things I've felt in myself, which I know amongst my friends and which I think you too may recognize. In all of us, there are powerful inhibitory forces working which block or deflect us from effective protest. I'll speak first of incomprehension and denial, second of social embarrassment, third of helplessness, and fourth, perhaps most sinister, of what I'd call the strange love syndrome, latent feelings of admiration, almost of appetite, for the bomb and the final solution it provides. I start with incomprehension, where I suspect many of us both begin and end. Nuclear weapons are not comprehensible. Neither you nor I have any hope of understanding just what they are and what they do. In saying that, I mean to belittle none of us. It's almost a compliment, for I don't see how any human being whose intelligence and sensitivities have been shaped by traditional facts and values could possibly understand the nature of these unnatural, otherworldly weapons. So-called facts about the bomb aren't facts in the ordinary sense at all. They're not facts we can relate to and get our minds around. Mere numbers, words. Let me repeat a fact. The bomb which was dropped on Hiroshima killed 140,000 people. The uranium it contained weighed about 25 pounds. It would have packed into a cricket ball. 140,000 people is about equal to the total population of Cambridge. Now, I for one can't grasp that kind of fact. I can't make the connection between a cricket ball and the deaths of everybody who lives in Cambridge. I can't picture the 140,000 bodies, let alone feel sympathy for each individual as he died. And when someone tells me, and I tell you, that a, that a war between the United States and Russia will now mean a second world war every second, and that the equivalent of 5,000 Hiroshima bombs will land in England, my imagination draws a blank. It's not just that I can't bear the thought, I can't even have the thought of 5,000 Hiroshima bombs. 5,000 times 140,000 people equals 700 million. 700 million dead out of a population of 50 million. Something wrong somewhere, everyone getting killed 10 or 20 times over. No, we close off from such nonsense. Try as we may, we shan't get the message. Our minds are minds finely tuned by culture and by evolution to respond to the frequencies of the real world. And when a message comes through on an alien wavelength, it sets up no vibrations. The so-called facts 
pass clean through us and away, like radio emissions from the stars. There are strange and interesting precedents in history. When Captain Cook's great ship, the Endeavour, sailed 200 years ago into Botany Bay, the Australian Aborigines who were fishing off the shore showed no reaction. The ship, I quote from Joseph Banks's journal of the voyage, the ship passed within a quarter of a mile of them, and yet they scarce lifted their eyes from their employment, expressed neither surprise nor concern. In the experience of these people, nothing so monstrous had ever been seen upon the surface of the waters, and now it seems they couldn't see it when it came. But theirs was a selective blindness. Cook put down his rowing boats. Now the natives were alarmed. Now they looked to their defenses. Blind to the greater but incomprehensible terror, they reacted quick enough to a threat which came within their ken. We too react selectively to man-sized threats. It's not giant dangers or giant tragedies, but the plight of single individual human beings which troubles us. In a week when 3,000 people are killed in an earthquake in Iran, a lone boy falls down a well shaft in Italy and the whole world grieves. Six million Jews are put to death in Hitler's Germany and it's Anne Frank trembling in her garret that remains stamped into our memory. The story of Hiroshima, too, can be told as the story of individual human beings. A tale, for example, of a little girl. When my grandmother came back, I asked, where's mother? I brought on my back, she answered. I was very happy and shouted, mama. But when I looked closely, I saw she was only carrying a rucksack. I was disappointed. Then my grandmother put the rucksack down and took out of it some bones. I miss my mother very much. Keiko Sasaki and her mother. But multiply the tragedy a hundred thousand times and it no longer has any meaning to us. We are each too human to understand the killing power of nuclear weapons, each of us too close to the good earth to understand how a metal cricket ball can explode with the force of 10,000 tons of TNT, each of us aboriginally blind. We must live with this blindness. It won't change. I don't expect my dog to learn to read the times, and I don't expect myself or any other human being to learn the meaning of nuclear war or to speak rationally about mega deaths or mega tons of TNT. The most we can ask for is an open recognition that neither we, when we protest against nuclear armaments, nor the politicians and the generals, when they defend them, know what we are talking about. And yet, we do know something about what we're talking about. We know, if nothing else, that we're talking about something which would, if it happened, be very, very bad. And in face of this knowledge, we may find ourselves suffering from another kind of blindness, a blindness equally human, but in many ways less innocent than the blindness which comes from lack of understanding. I mean the deliberate blindness which comes over us when we see something and then reject it, when we recognize the truth or at least part of the truth and finding it perhaps too painful or too, too inconvenient, we censor its access to our conscious minds. I mean what psychologists have called denial. Call it wishful thinking, if you like, or call it optimism, or call it the good old British habit of not taking things too seriously. It comes to the same thing. There are, of course, obvious and good excuses for denial. It not only makes for a comfortable life, it makes, some would argue, for the only kind of worthwhile life there is. Certainly, we can't carry on as normal under the shadow of the bomb. The prospect of nuclear war would, if we allowed it to, be totally distracting and totally depressing. It would, if we allowed it to, take away the meaning from the rest of our life and finish us off as creative and productive people. It's a prospect which flatly contradicts every other prospect we hold dear. Human beings strive for consistency in their affairs. They can't, at least they can't for long, hold incompatible beliefs. Either it seems we look to the right of the picture or else the left. Either we believe the world is threatened by extinction or else we don't. 
How can we at one and the same time declare ourselves for human rights, devote ourselves to our children, labor to produce lasting works of art and scholarship, and take seriously a vision of the future in which there are no children, in which our books will never be read, and our paintings, our houses, our flower gardens will end as dust. One or the other vision has to go. Let's not be deceived. The dangers will not be diminished because we close our eyes to them. If we can't carry on as normal under the shadow of the bomb, then for the time being, we have a duty not to carry on as normal. We live at a time when to deny the prospect of death may well cost us our lives. But try telling that to other people. Try telling it in Gath and publishing it in the streets of Ascalon. The cartoon may have been drawn 50 years ago, but the attitude of the daughters of the Philistines is little changed. To speak the truth amongst people who don't want to hear it is considered almost an aggressive act, an invasion of privacy, a trespass into someone else's space, not nice, not done. Last autumn, in Pennsylvania, United States, eight nuclear protesters who called themselves the Plowshares Eight, including amongst them two priests, a nun, a lawyer, and a professor of history, broke into a weapons factory and damaged the nose cone of a Mark 12A missile with a hammer. They were accused at their trial of burglary, criminal conspiracy, and trespass. Each faced a maximum sentence of 25 years. This time, the prosecution said, this time you've gone too far. They had gone too far. They had trespassed. But their trespass wasn't so much against the property of the General Electric Company as against the minds of the American people. By attacking the missile with a hammer, they were forcing other people to think, however briefly, about a subject regarded as indecent, the question of just what that missile might be for. Their behavior was embarrassing, not nice. Niceness can be a virtue. Most of us are nice people. We won't, we won't put other people out of countenance if we can help it. We won't deliberately rob them of comforting illusions. But niceness can be a dreadful vice as well. Here's what Heinrich Himmler had to say in a speech in 1943. In public, we will never talk about it. It is with us, thank God, an inborn gift of tactfulness that we have never conversed about this matter, never spoken about it. I am referring to the extermination of the Jewish people. Indeed, Himmler didn't refer in public to the extermination of the Jewish people. Words like special treatment were made to serve instead. But the Nazis weren't alone in their anxiety to avoid plain speaking. The victims did so too. We find certain elders of the Jewish community referring to the trains which took their brothers and sisters to the killing centers as favored transport. Even in Auschwitz, a crematorium would be called a bakery. And now, who can avoid the parallel with our own situation and the tricks of language which good taste and good form impose upon discussions, at least official discussions, of the bomb? For special treatment, read demographic targeting. For bakery, read domestic fallout shelter. But it would be wrong to pretend that it's only our own decent reticence which holds us from breaking these taboos. We will, and we're generally quite well aware of it, be made to pay a public price for going too far. And other people don't want to know. They don't want to know. And they don't take kindly to the self-appointed prophet who sees it as his duty to inform them. In the old days, it's said that kings would kill the messenger who brought bad news. Today, in the United States, the messenger may, as almost happened to the Plowshares 8, be silenced by the law. In Russia, he may get locked up in a mental hospital. But there are other and subtler ways of restraining those who might otherwise speak out. And in our own country, none is better tried or more effective than the technique of the social pillory. Anyone who forces an unwanted confrontation on the subject of the bomb is liable to be punished for his impudence by being mocked, snubbed, made the butt of sneers and ridicule. 
and we all know the standard vocabulary of put-downs. Idealist, pacifist, moralist, holier than thou. Such epithets have been with us a long time. The same schoolboy insults which Winston Churchill used to disparage those who objected to, using, to, objected to the idea of using anthrax bombs in the last war. Psalm-singing defeatists, Churchill called them. They've now been dusted off by the brave editors of the Daily This or Morning That for use against our nuclear disarmers. And in settings where such cliches might be seen for what they are, cleverer men can be counted on to produce cleverer but equally dismissive sneers. Alistair Cook, for example, writing about Bertrand Russell in the Manchester Guardian some years ago. A midget suspended against a huge cinemascope screen, a charming puppet straining for a miracle and in the act wobbling the tiny wire frame of his body. It is, he said in his high nasal voice, it is the most important question that men have ever had to decide in the whole history of the human race. A clever insult. Yes, a clever insult whereby a man who's shown too much emotion is defined as a puppet, a doll without emotion. Lord Russell, peer of the realm and the greatest philosopher in England, was surely able to weather such abuse. But few of us have Russell's social or his intellectual confidence. Hardly surprising if we sometimes persuade ourselves that whatever we think privately, it's just not our place to make a public stand against the bomb. Lords, philosophers, priests, actresses, they do that kind of thing. They can make exhibitions of themselves. But for the rest of us, well, on the whole, all things considered, we like to keep calm. It's just not our way to scream or sing psalms or call things the most important question in the whole history of the human race. Even when the water's lapping round our feet, first one to panic is a wet. But there's another, and in some ways more telling reason, why even the most courageous of, courageous of us may be reluctant to speak out. Not so much that we mind the accusations of bad form or that we're embarrassed to find ourselves mentioning an unmentionable problem, as that we're embarrassed to find ourselves mentioning it and yet doing nothing more. If we're going to alarm people, we'd better alarm them to some purpose. We'd better offer a solution to the problem and what's more, we'd better show by our example that we ourselves are actively pursuing it. We can't simply knock on our neighbor's door and say, the world is standing on the edge of the final abyss, I thought you'd like to know. If we ourselves don't have a solution, or if we're not prepared to dedicate our lives to finding one, then it's not only other people, but our own consciences that will tell us to shut up. There's no honor whatever in being a helpless prophet all dressed up with protest and nowhere to go. Helplessness. I mean the dreadful feeling many of us know that there is in fact nothing we can do, that we are indeed midgets dwarfed by mighty forces over which individual human beings have no control. I find no objective reasons for this helplessness. There's nothing in the political economic or strategic situation which dictates that the world must continue on its present course. When people talk about the Russian threat or about the power of the military industrial complex or about the unstoppable march of weapons technology, they're providing covers, not explanations for why the race goes on. I've yet to hear of one good reason for not stopping it tomorrow. One good reason, that is, except for the sense of helplessness itself. For helplessness can be a self-confirming process. It's a malady of the human spirit, which once it's got going, needs no good reasons to continue. When people believe themselves helpless, helpless they become. Psychologists recognize two kinds of helplessness. Learned helplessness, may develop when, for example, a person's repeatedly found that previous efforts to take control of his own life have genuinely come to nothing. He loses all faith in his own effectiveness and carries over to the present a picture of himself as someone unable any longer to influence events. And doesn't learning play at least some part in the helplessness 
we now feel when confronted by nuclear weapons. We live in a society where people have in fact increasingly found themselves unable to take control over their own lives. An unemployed laborer helpless to get himself a job. A homeless couple helpless to find themselves a lodging. A businessman helpless against market forces. Are such people likely to retain much faith in their power to act against the bomb? But there's a different sort of helplessness as well. A superstitious helplessness, where a person's belief in his own impotence has no basis in experience, but results instead from nothing more than a superstitious premonition that his life, and perhaps the life of the whole world, is set on an unalterable course. Unalterable, that is, by human agency. The belief, for example, that his own fate has been sealed by a specific curse, or that the, the world over, God and the devil are working out their higher purposes without care for individual human beings. I say no more than such a superstitious premonition, but superstitious, superstitious helplessness can take the fight out of a man quite as effectively as any more reasonable fear. One of the delegates to this year's reunion of Holocaust survivors, Cordelia Edvardsen, described how some of the Jews in Germany fell victim to just such a paralyzing superstition. Of course, she says, of course we wanted to survive, but we weren't at all sure that we had the right to survive. And when a person no longer believes he has the right to survive, his helplessness itself is killing. I quote from a study of what's been called voodoo death. A Brazilian Indian condemned and sentenced by a medicine man dies within hours. In Australia, a witch doctor points a bone at a man. Believing that nothing can save him, the man rapidly sinks in spirits and prepares to die. Earlier, I cited the statistics from a New Society poll Nine out of ten people worried by nuclear weapons declared that there is nothing they can do. Nothing but sink in spirits and prepare to die. We behave at times as though we've been hexed by the bomb, put under a spell. A superstitious belief in the bomb as an engine of fate over which human beings have no control has obvious origins in the human imagination. The bomb is patently a superhuman weapon, mind-blowingly destructive, and if we so see it, mind-blowingly magnificent. Small wonder if people's fear is mixed with awe if they become hypnotized by its dread beauty and its fascinating power. The bomb's first makers, the physicists who put it together in 1945, themselves treated their creation with almost mystical reverence. When Robert Oppenheimer, witnessed the, the earliest test explosion in the New Mexico desert at Alamogordo, the words which came to him were from the holy book, the Bhagavad Gita. If the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. The test was given the code name Trinity. And in the official report of the explosion, the language is full of specifically Christian imagery. Here's part of the report which was rushed to President Truman, who was meeting with Churchill and Stalin at Potsdam. It lighted every peak, crevice, and ridge of the nearby mountain range with a clarity and beauty that cannot be described, but must be seen to be imagined. It was the beauty the great poets dream about, but describe most poorly and inadequately. Then came the strong, sustained, awesome roar which warned of doomsday and made us feel that we puny things were blasphemous to dare tamper with the forces heretofore reserved to the Almighty. Heretofore reserved to the Almighty? And hereinafter reserved to Truman, Churchill and Stalin? to Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and Leonid Brezhnev? No. We may be forgiven if we see our political leaders as servants and not masters to this force, and the bomb itself as a wrathful giant, which having been woken from its slumbers, 
will take vengeance on man's jack-like arrogance. It's easy to understand how people may move from this kind of superstitious image to a truly apocalyptic image vision of nuclear war. And I mean now apocalyptic in the old-fashioned sense, a day of judgment, a day when the bomb will come to judge both the quick and the dead, a day which will be seen by some as a day of renewal, a cleansing holocaust, when our decadent civilization must atone for its sins, its failure to understand or to make proper use of the gifts of science and technology, its failure in the third world, its failure to establish a firm moral order. For evidence that there are in fact people in this country who see the Holocaust as a period of renewal, read the magazine of the nuclear shelter industry, Protect and Survive Monthly. The frontier spirit is, we'll find, still alive and well and living somewhere in England in 10 years' time when the survivors of the next world war will be leading heroically self-sufficient lives off the thin of the land, smiling and whistling and shooting their way out of all difficulties. Or read, no, you won't be allowed to because it's a confidential document, but read, if you could, the contingency war plan of one of our regional health authorities. In its way, a nation is like a forest, and the aim of war planning is to secure survival of the great trees. If all the great trees and much of the brushwood are felled, a forest may not regenerate for centuries. If a sufficient number of the great trees is left, however, if felling is to some extent selective and controlled, recovery is swift. There will remain brushwood enough if 30 million survivors can be so described. The planning policy is clearly elitist. The author of this official document wasn't, I think, directly quoting Nietzsche, the, ph the philosopher who inspired the Nazis, but he might have been. Examine, Nietzsche wrote, examine the lives of the best and most fruitful men and peoples and ask yourselves whether a tree, if it's to grow proudly into the sky, can do without bad weather and storms. Apocalyptic fantasies have always lurked not far beneath the surface of men's subconscious minds. They've emerged again and again in history at times of trouble, moral insecurity, uncertainty. In the Middle Ages, the image of the Day of Judgment would have been familiar to us, one of the few pictures we knew, painted up above the transept on the walls of the local church. We'd have heard the words of St. John's Revelation thundered from the pulpit. I read them now as a description of a fantasy which could be the reality of nuclear war. I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Fall on us, that strange imperative. In this state of mind, people may be lured, maybe may come to welcome the very thing they fear, they may feel lured to the imminent catastrophe, like Trilby to her Svengali, like rabbits mesmerized by the twisting snake. Such is the strange love syndrome, an attachment to the engines of destruction, an attachment even to the blissful state of being destroyed. For people don't really accept the facts of their own deaths. Like a suicide who leaves a note. I picture you reading this note when I'm gone, People picture themselves standing above the chaos in which they themselves have died, and they may experience a sickening sense of excitement at the images of destruction and decay. Do it beautifully, says Hedda Gabler to Loveborg as she hands him the gun. Oh yes, we'll do it beautifully. 
What more beautiful way to do it than in the way that poets dream about, but describe most poorly and inadequately? But Lovborg's gun goes off by accident, and he dies miserably, shot not through the heart, but through the balls. The bomb is not beautiful. We must call down the curtain on this tragic play, scream it off the stage. Silence, said Nadezhda Mandelstam. Silence is the real crime. In Russian, her name, Nadezhda, means hope. The hope lies in hope. Just as despair can be a self-fulfilling self prophecy, so can its opposite. Hope, too, will create its own object by giving us the strength of mind and voice to tackle our embarrassment, our helplessness, our own dark images of death, and come through to a world not merely of our making, but of our choosing. When Mountbatten asks, do any of those responsible for this disastrous course pull themselves together and reach for the brakes? The answer must be, watch me. And the answer, no, can be reserved for a different question. The question Jacob Bronowski himself asked at the end of his essay, Science and Human Values. Has science fastened upon our society a monstrous gift of destruction which we can neither undo nor master and which, like a clockwork automaton, is set to break our necks? No, the bomb is not an uncontrollable automaton and we aren't uncontrolling people. Our control lies, as it always has done, whenever it's been tried, in the force of public argument and public anger. It was public opinion in this country which forced the ending of the slave trade, opinion marshaled then, as it can be now, by pamphlets, speeches, and meetings in every village hall. It was fear of the public's outcry which, pre which prevented President Nixon from using an atom bomb in Vietnam. And it was the protests of the American people against that cruel and pointless war which eventually secured the American withdrawal. And now in Poland, it's the people's loud support for free trades unions which is forcing changes on the reluctant communist machine. We forget sometimes our own power. In this country, every penny spent on armaments is money we subscribe. Every acre of grass behind every barbed wire fence round every bomber base is an acre of our land. And every decision taken by every minister of state is a decision made on our behalf by a representative elected to our service. If those we entrust to manage our affairs adopt strange policies, if they turn out in office to be double agents, one hand to pat our babies, the other raised in salute to the bomb, then we have the right and the duty to dismiss them as unfit. What happens when an irresistible force meets a movable object? Why it moves? But it won't happen quietly. Now, Dejda's hope was loud and strident. Ours must be, too. Dylan Thomas spoke these words to his aging father. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. <laughs>